Okay, we're back again and again and again. It's the Jimmy Show, live from the Scott Cafe in Framingham, Massachusetts. I'm Jimmy Young, along with Jimmy Myers. And together, we are twin brothers, different mothers. And the beautiful... See, this is not going to be the stuff you're going to hear on your local radio station. I'm a make love, not war guy. And me too. All right. Whoever's going to come buy it, that franchise is not worth $500 million right now. No, that sir. franchise is worth over a billion. He's going to get over a billion for his insensitive remarks and so forth. That tells me something's wrong in my country. Something is wrong here. No, 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 Derek, would you like to have a fourth place? I'm, I'm so sorry I had to call you out. I like that. And, and Fine, I'm still, I still think it is better that they have taken power away from Goodell and put it into a committee so that he is not the only person that is saying, you're suspended for this many games, mm-hmm. you're suspended for that many games. All I have to do is stay black and look good. <laughs> That's all I got to do. <laughs> they can get away with just about anything. And Ray, if they had had video cameras that night that's right Woo! That's right you may not have been ray lewis and we are twin brothers different brothers and that's what it is in sports see you next time it's 6 30 ish that's the time for the Jimmies. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Knobscot Cafe in Framingham, Massachusetts. I'm Jimmy Young, along with my uh, friend, yeah, Jimmy I'm Myers. Still Jimmy Myers. Last time I checked, I'm you still are? Jimmy Myers. Yes, That's I am. good. Thank mm-hmm. you. Very good. It's always good to see Mr. Myers. He was here earlier with our kids. Now it's time for the grown-ups to talk a little bit uh, about sports. Of course, the Patriots still, everybody is beaming about their 51-23 win over the Chicago Bears yesterday. Tom Brady came to play. The guy's a winner. He's always going to be a winner, and he played almost perfect football yesterday. Mm-hmm. Is he not one of the fiercest competitors that has been in the Boston area? No question. There's, there's no question about that. But look at the team they were playing. Chicago Bears are, are a team that is in real trouble. They have major, major problems in that locker room, on the field. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll take the win. Yes, you'll take the win. But their stiffer tests are down the road. The next five weeks... When they face the likes Denver. of Rodgers, uh, Manning, and those guys, you're going to find out what this team is made of. And, uh, you know, it, it's quiet as it's kept. Uh, Brandon Browner. I know, we talked about him. He played, he played extremely game. well. And, and now you have two corners that, right. can de- that can play one-on-one, which frees up your linebackers to be able to do certain things. So it'll be interesting to see how they match up with Denver. But I'm going to tell you, I, I, I saw something yesterday in the Pittsburgh game that I will look for. Now, whether you remember or not, because so many of you New England fans have very short memories. Last year, Denver put a whipping on these guys, up to like 31 nothing, if memory serves me correctly. And the, first and the half. Patriots roared the back. First half. Wait, wait a minute, hold yeah. on, hear me out. Yeah, I hear you. The problem is that I believe that Peyton Manning and them will approach the game the same way that the Pittsburgh Steelers approached the game with the Colts yesterday. You keep running up points. You have to have add-on points. It's almost like playing baseball in Fenway Park. You never have enough runs. So they're going to probably figure, if we get 31 or we get up on them, we're going to keep driving the ball. We're not going to the running game. We're going to keep trying to keep pressure on their defense to score as many points as possible. Because of watching Roethlisberger yesterday, oh. I was not surprised. No, but I was not surprised that, that, um, that the Colts came back. Yeah. I just wasn't surprised because I know Andrew Luck he has that beautiful short memory. Make a couple of bad plays, turn around and come right back. Right. And so you know, I, and I, I wasn't surprised he was going to do that. But I was, I was more impressed with Pittsburgh's offense, and and I was less impressed with the fact the Colts' defense is just not that good. Right. And I think that's where I was going to go. Is uh, how good are those defenses of the Colts and the Steelers? They're giving up that many points. Yeah, they're not that. Good. And I think you're going to find that the Patriots' defense is going to get better and better now because of Browner's presence, because he's got Revis on the other side, mm-hmm. uh, and they're going. Look, here's the beautiful thing about football next week. I think everybody agrees the Denver Broncos are playing the best football in the league. Every power ranking I've seen over the last 24 hours has the Denver Broncos as the number one team in the NFL. The Patriots jumped from seven to three. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's and that's, the Cowboys. That's hang more on a second. That's the hype the game. Too. I understand, and the co- of course the Cowboys are two. The Cowboys are two, and they're mm-hmm. playing tonight mm-hmm. against the Washington Football Team. Yep. And thank you for saying that. I really appreciate. I'm that. trying to. I Go really ahead. the last the last show I kind of snuck in that other name, and I didn't like it. I don't okay. like it. Mm-hmm. I, you know. Go ahead. But uh, that being said. It's going to be fun to watch tonight, the uh, Washington football team against Dallas, because I think Dallas is playing really good football. I don't know how the heck they're doing it, because it's basically the same team they had last year, for the most part. They lost more players than they, they gained. Um, but it, it'll be interesting. Look, well, one before you, wait, hang on a second. we got one minute before mm-hmm. you have the biggest problem, because I want to set up the call mm-hmm. that we're going to make, because uh, Jimmy has been working hard on lining up this interview with Jim Clemens, the assistant coach for the New York Knicks, and we're going to make that call and Jimmy, tell us a little bit about Jim Clemens as I make the call, and then let's put our little earpieces in so we know we'll be able to hear him, because that's what we're able to do here at the Knobscott Cafe. Mm-hmm. It's very exciting. Uh, let me just make I got this. to know Jimmy Clemens back in the year of 1971. I know some of you weren't even born at that time. Um, he was a rookie playing for the uh, Los Angeles Lakers. He had been drafted because there was speculation that Jerry West, who had suffered some major injuries, was getting ready to retire. So they drafted Jimmy Clemens in the fact that they were ready to replace Jerry West and they had a top flight rookie coming out of Ohio State who could score. He could flat out score. But then once Jerry West decided he was going to play another year and his health did not deteriorate, it stayed at an even level. There you go. Now you have a very talented player in Jimmy ring? Clemens. No, I can't hear it. Well, you put the other there. So, so, yeah, I can hear it. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, now you have now you have a very talented hello. player in, this, in, in, in the gentleman that's on the phone, Jimmy Clemens. How you doing? Jimmy, Jimmy can, can, you hear me? can you hear any of us? I, I can hear you. All righty. How you doing, Jim? Why can't he hear me? I don't know why he can't hear you, but I'm going to do this. Watch this, because he can hear me. Right, Jim? Hello? Hello? Can you hear us now? I can hear you. All righty. As I was just saying, Jimmy Clemens, you come into the league in 1971, 72. You get a chance to be a part of one of the greatest teams, as far as regular season is concerned, in the history of this game. I also mentioned the fact that people were talking that Jerry West was going to retire. It's one of the reasons why the Lakers drafted you. But here you are as a rookie. You get to come in and practice against two Hall of Famers in Gail Goodrich and Jerry West every day. Let's pick up the story from there. What was that like as a rookie coming in on that team with four Hall of Famers, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, Jerry West, and Gail Goodrich? What was that like, Jimmy? (laughs) I love to laugh. Well, uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, you know, it's, uh, not not too often do you get drafted by a team that uh, has that type of personnel, that type of uh, as you said, you said four future Hall of Famers, and well, you, well, at that point in time, I, I'm not sure. If, uh, Pat Riley knew that he was going to be a Hall of Famer, and I'm, I'm thinking Pat's a Hall of Famer. I correct mm-hmm. him that or not? Yeah, as a coach, but not yeah, as a well, player. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, not as a player, but, but see, that, that's, that's even better because uh, I think the Hall of Fame should also recognize those that make contributions, not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, due to their athleticism on the on the floor, but uh, what they do for the game. So I think that's also you know, very good critical thinking. But you know, getting back to uh, the four that you mentioned, uh, it was uh, it was just truly an honor. I mean, let's, let's face it, uh, when, you, you, when you're drafted by a franchise, uh, you, you expect to just come and play and try to earn your stripes and do the best you can to uh, contribute to uh, a an atmosphere and culture that will lead to hopefully some success, and that certainly happened to, to me in, in this particular case. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I was very happy, very thankful that it, it happened. And uh, and uh, once again, I didn't get a lot of playing time that year, but certainly being a being in that type of environment, you know, I thought was going to be conducive to uh, a good uh, a good career for me. Uh, I thought the people that were around me were outstanding basketball minds, and 
Uh, you couldn't ask for, a, a, you know, a, a rookie, in, my, in this case, you know, being able to, you know, provide a, a background and, you know, mm-hmm. to learn the game of basketball and hopefully it will contribute somewhere down the line. Jimmy, think about this very quickly. The fact of what practice must have been like going out there with those guys. Because you told me practice was intense. Because I'm going out there to show them I can play. And they're out there saying, yeah, we know we can play, but he has to wait his turn. But practices were pretty pretty intensified, weren't they? Well, practice was... Uh, practice were, were good, solid uh, educational experiences. And then... A, you know, as we as we broke uh, training camp that year, uh, you know, I, I was aware, I, I knew who Bill Sharma was as a, as a coach, but I had no idea about his coaching philosophy. And uh, we, we kept stats in in, in practice, uh, you know, shooting percentages, turnovers, uh, which teams uh, played well against each other. So you know, uh, very thorough. And, uh, and 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 what he and what he what he did, and he pulled me aside uh, before we we broke camp, uh, going to Hawaii, and he told me I'd had a good camp. Because uh, he, you have to, Jimmy, you have to remember, uh, Bill was a coach when the draft took place. I was I was Craig Schaub's uh, uh, selection, mm-hmm. and so he, I was kind of like given to him, and I don't know if I've been selected, his selection if not, but I was drafted and Bill was named coach down the line, so you know, it was just kind of, you know, this is what I got, this is what he got. And so I think that uh, not knowing me and not knowing maybe what to expect, uh, maybe I surprised him about, you know, how I played the game or how I competed, I, I don't know, but he didn't play rookies anyway, so it didn't make a big, uh, didn't make a big difference. <laughs> But he, you know, uh, he told me that I played well, but he didn't play rookie. But he had certain things that he wanted me to do uh, to kind of earn my stripes. And he would be, you know, looking at me as I participated in practice, and then I be, hopefully would grow, would grow. And he, uh, he made certain suggestions for me if I wanted to play down the line or if I wanted to have a, you know, solid pro career, which uh, which I did take uh, in heed and. And, and under advisement, but uh, you know it, it was it was kind of I'm not gonna say it wasn't shocking, but you know he said that he had a lot of veterans to play in front of me, and that uh, they were gonna get the first opportunity to play, and I thought that was fair. I mean, once again, you know, he didn't know me from Adam, and nothing in my in my uh, athletic career up at that point in time had ever been quote unquote given to me anyway. I felt that uh, you know, this is part of the script of being uh, being an athlete. You earn you earn yourself uh, a position on the team, and then you earn playing time, and all that is meted out, and you don't worry about it. And uh, but he just flat out told me that uh, he didn't play rookie. Uh, he got hurt, and they were going to get the first opportunity to play. And uh, we started. You know, if they couldn't you know, play well, then I would get an opportunity. But in the meantime, my job is to make the veterans play hard every day. Don't take days off to learn as much as I can from the veterans. Uh, in those days, scouting reports were given orally in, in the, in the uh, locker room prior to game, and players went around, and they and you virtually talked about who you were going to guard that particular night, and the, the strengths, the weaknesses, uh, and how the strategy was going to be to defend them. And uh, so you were expected to know these things, and coach suggested that I keep a notebook about uh, the various guards I'd be playing up against and uh, the, the tendency and uh, and in my spare time uh, uh, review these notes and so that when it came time to play them I would be familiar about uh, the scouting reports that were given and watch the game uh, you know intently during the game and don't get caught up on uh, you know uh, other distractions so you know, very solid information, and, and uh, I, I just love being being a member of a professional team. And, and hey, man, we played we played back home uh, for free. We played in college to get a college, <laughs> scholarship, and I was a professional, and I was getting paid. This this is my career, and I, and uh, 
I was loving every bit of it, man. Hey, that's great. Uh, Jimmy, this is the other Jimmy, and now we have three Jimmys on the Jimmys. We have a lot of Jimmys tonight. i got to ask you about this year's team and the Knicks, and talk a little bit about the adaptation of Phil Jackson's triangle offense to the current personnel that you have with the Knicks. Is that happening, or is he adapting uh, his own philosophy to the talent that he has on his roster? Well... Let me say this about the question that you posed to me. Uh, we're, 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 we're running what is called the, 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 the triangle, but the correct name is Triple Post. And, and it does have a sideline triangle feature, and that's how we deploy our, our, our teammates and our, our colleagues, or, or hopefully uh, the best execution in basketball. And, and so we, we have an opportunity to win night in. Uh, Phil, the text winner, made the, made the uh, triple post, I guess, uh, historic in, in the sense that what, what, we were, what, what they were able to do, and I, I, I've been fortunate and very blessed to be a part of this because when Phil took over the team head coach of the Chicago Bulls in 95, 96, Six. Oh, eight, eight, 80, 89, 90. See, I'm getting mm -hmm. hit on myself. I was, I was the newest member of that staff. In fact, I was the only new member of the staff because Tex winner Johnny Bach still was the assistant under. That Doug Collins? Oh, wow. Under Doug Collins. Yep. Yeah, man. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, the story and all is getting hit on me. But the fact, the fact is, and then there were some questions. Dex wanted to run the run the triple post under Doug, but Doug was against it. Doug didn't like the, the offense, and so Doug ran the offense that he thought was better suited, which is which is fine, fine and great. But Phil was a believer in the, in the triangle, and then when he got promoted to head coach, then he was able under Texas guidance to to run the triple post. Mm -hmm. um, Phil. Is now the president of the of the Knicks, and Derek Fisher is the coach, and Derek is running the triple post, and we're trying to institute it in, as as an offensive weapon and uh, what we what we want to do offensively, as he has learned it under under Phil and, and so forth. So, you know, it Phil's the president, Derek's the coach, and you know until Phil comes out of the uh, out of his office and runs practice. This is all Derek's business, mm -hmm. and I, I mean, sure enough, we, we do have field sessions. Don't get me wrong on that. Mm -hmm. But Derek, Derek is doing the coaching and the teaching of it, and uh, along with uh, Kurt Ramis and myself and Rasheed, Rasheed Hazard, uh, and she, you know, we're we're, we're trying to uh, give it our best rendition based on the personnel that we have. And the, and, and to be honest with you, Jimmy. Uh, the, the spirit, the uh, energy and practice has been wonderful. The guys have embraced uh, the knowledge and they respect it. Uh, what, the, what the Lakers have done with the triangle, we, they embraced what the Bulls did uh, in, the, uh, uh, in doing their run. Uh, we, we've watched clips. We, we try to not imitate, but we see how... Uh, it's been formed. We, we see the precision and, and how the ball has been shared. But that, that's just a guideline. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the team that we have right now that's going to take, take the floor on Wednesday night, they're going to run it, but they've got to run it to their own identity. And uh, we, we're not trying to imitate what the, what the Bulls did in, in their run and what the Lakers did in, in, the, in the 90s and early 2000s. But what, we, what, we, uh, what, we, what we're trying to do is uh, just put the personnel that the, that the Knicks have available and just run a solid offense that has uh, all the ingredients uh, that we think that needed to be a, a good basketball team. And that's just sharing the basketball that's being very good fundamental uh, uh, with our skills and, and uh, that, uh, that we're learning from it. And, and as we move the basketball, set screens and hopefully knock down shots. That, that, that's the basis that we're trying to do. Basically, you're still talking about the offense, though, Jimmy. Uh, and you're looking at 
the a whole concept of the league and how much it's changed since you were a player, since you first became an assistant coach until now. Now, everybody talks about the egos of the players. Everybody talks about these young guys are hard to coach. But you're telling me, as I'm listening to you, that this group that you have has been receptive as to what you guys are trying to do so far. Well, they, they have been. Now, this, now when, when the rubber's going to hit the road, it's how successful that we are. Mm -hmm. And we go through some difficult times. Will they be, still be committed uh, to, to this point in time? I mean, you know, we were three and five in our exhibition games, and there were some games right there that could have gone uh, differently. But but the fact is, when 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 we, when we meet those dog days of uh, uh, February, oh yes, January, and if we go through, I mean, we've got 18 games starting Wednesday night. Well, uh, from we got 18 games in the, in the next 30, 31 days. So we we're gonna have, we, wow. you know, we don't get off off to a good start. You know, you know, with, with the press and uh, the, the, uh, the, the the need to you know to win in New York City with the, with the media. You know, uh, you know how, how ruthless will they be? And 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 the, and the, and the fact to play and the, what what questions they gonna throw out. Uh, but our hope is that we, we're strong enough mentally and physically and committed enough that everything will um, end up uh, through the hard work and dedication that uh, we won't be uh, drawn apart, we'll have some success, and at the end of the day, the commitment and the dedication of uh, what, what we're saying that we want to do, we'll, we'll, we won't waver. And we're going to stay true to who we, we want to be and trying to become as a basketball club in, uh, in 2014, 2015, season and beyond. And we all know it's not going to be easy. I mean, I, I think you'd be uh, absolutely foolish to think that it's going to be a walk through the park. And, and uh, you know, you look at the teams in the East. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Chicago on Wednesday night, Cleveland on, uh, on Thursday night. Uh, we play Toronto twice in uh, – in the preseason, they're going to be they're going to be a tough out. Uh, you know, I think Washington's going to be, going to be a tough uh, tough out. Uh, so, uh, you know, we know we we, we recognize we have got a tough road to hold. But the fact is, when we have enough success that we you know, uh, and our, will our locker room stay in intact to say, yeah, we know we're going to have some difficulty, but through the but through the storm and through the trials and tribulations. We're going to stay committed to being a, a good basketball team, and, and this is what we hope to hold together. Now, I know, and, oh, excuse me. I, I noticed oh, you didn't mention the Celtics in there, Jimmy, and uh, uh, I understand why, first of all. That being said, I do want to ask you about the, the back end of the roster. When you have that kind of a schedule, how much – do you do more teaching of the back end of the of the roster, you know, the guys that are 10, 11, 12 on your roster, uh, as opposed to relying on your starters to burn themselves out in the beginning of the season? No, well, you have to have some depth in this league. And we, as, as, as you look at our, at our roster right now, and, I, and to be honest with you, right now, We've got a couple of spots based on our matchups uh, Wednesday night. I can't tell you point blank who's going to start. Mm. Uh, but, but that being said, we think that if we don't start Amari at the, at, the, at the four, then he'll come off the bench. And we've got uh, Jason Smith that can uh, uh, come off the bench if we start Amari. We, I don't know right now. We're going to start uh, J.R. Smith, uh, and that means that uh, Iman Shepard will come off the, will come off the bench, or Tim Hardaway Jr. So uh, you know we we've got the uh, Pablo uh, coming off the bench, and probably the backup. So we we got we got good solid backups. The question is, you know, if we look at our roster, if we we got to manage minutes. So that uh, Amari doesn't get worn down, and we got managed minutes so that uh, Melo doesn't get worn down. So I think we got viable backups in every, in every spot, 
and because of the, the system that we want to run, and if, and if we're good at, at running it and, and executing, uh, hopefully we'll get knowledge out of, out of some players that people right now think of just quote unquote air, average players. But uh, if you go back and look at the history of role players that we had in, in both Chicago and, and, and Los Angeles, those role players, quote unquote, can become very, very viable people to the, to the system because they will add to our depth. And that's what we're hoping in, in this particular case. Um, so your expectations on that, uh, Jimmy, you, you obviously, every coach, I think when you go into a season, feels like you got the right personnel, you're going to roll the ball out and just see who plays. And I would also think that there's a kind of an early season expectation and you're a little anxious because it's the first game and you still get those uh, pre-game, let's call them uh, butterflies? Well, I, I, I think that, uh, I don't know if we're going to have butterflies. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're, we open up in the garden and, you know, and, and being, being at home, you know, there, there are a lot of expectations. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, our first three games are, are going to be crucial. Uh, and by being crucial, I mean, I think you'll, you'll, there'll, there'll be some, indica some indication of where, where we are and where we need to go. I mean, first two games are, are Chicago, Cleveland, and the game on Sunday is, is Charlotte. And Charlotte, I think, is, is going to be a, a team we're going to have to reckon with in, in the East as well. So, uh you know, we, we just got to play. You know, you, there's 82 games out there, and uh, you know, if we, we if we start out 0 and 3, we, we, I, I don't want it to be too too low. If we start out 3 and 0, we we don't need to be too high because there's still uh, 79 79 games that we have to be played, and we got to play them uh, uh, one at a time. And each one, each each win or each loss. In uh, late October and early November, it's just as important and just as vital as those games coming down the stretch in the middle of April. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we, we, we know that we've got a, we've got a learning curve. And we, we know that we're, we're a basketball club, that a lot is going to be asked of us and people are going to be reviewing how we play and, and how our body language is and how we react to the whole season. But the big, but the big thing, we, we just have to play together. We've got to play night in and night out uh, with the best basketball we, we can. And, mm -hmm. and, and to be honest with you guys, the best basketball that we can play, we, we have to be married on both sides of the floor. I mean, I, I mean the, tri the triangle and the triple post offense, obviously the focal point of the media, but we all recognize that if those teams in Chicago and those teams in, in, in Los Angeles they were also pretty good defensive teams, and we don't want to lose sight of the fact that if we're going to have, if we're going to be a good basketball club, and we and we want to we want to have some sort of a, a postseason, yes, the offense has to be good, but our defense has to be better. Mm -hmm. We don't want to get lost, and we want to we don't want to hang all put all our eggs in the basket that it's the offense, it's the offense, yeah, the offense and the defense both and both have to be on point. That we hope to have the season that uh, we're hoping to have. Jimmy, you mentioned earlier about the contributions that people make to the game. And I always look at assistant coaches. I look at guys like you. I look at some of the guys that – and the fact that the NBA really has not recognized a lot of the great assistant coaches in this league. Here you are, an assistant coach with nine rings – as an assistant and I know some players who would dream of just having one you got one as a player nine as an assistant how do you impart this knowledge to these young guys who have never won anything and are under the pressure of New York City of being in that fishbowl knowing that these these fans want to win worse than anything how do you impart any of that knowledge Jimmy well first thing you try not to worry about other people's expectations. I, I think just just being a professional athlete, regardless of the sport, 
uh, there's, there's a lot of expectations of, of, of your, your fan base. Now, that, that's not a bad thing because in some cities, they, they would love to have the expectations of, of, of winning. But at the same point in time, you, you have to temper those expectations with your ability to digest the information in front of you, your willingness to, to play the team. And, and when you talk about team sports, you, you have to also recognize, you know, as management, giving, giving you, the team, and uh, the best players who want to be part of the team. Mm -hmm. in, in this day and age, you know, uh, a, a lot of guys just want, their, want to be having their brand out there. They, they talk about winning, but you look at the way they play the game, they, their play isn't consistent to that of winning a championship. So a, lot, a lot of guys get caught up in just trying to prove that they are best players or one of the best players and they talk about winning a championship but winning a championship means at some point in time I'm, I'm going to use the word sacrifice but at the same point in time good players realize that they have to be able to play with other teammates I mean, early, in the, early in this conversation we talked about uh, Chamberlain, West and uh, Baylor I mean, in, in 1971, 72, you, you couldn't get a bigger, a bigger three. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I was very blessed that I was there at the end of their careers where Jerry had not won a championship, Elgin had not won a championship, and Will had won a championship in Philadelphia uh, with, the, with the 76ers. And so, right, you talking about having a big three and, and ego. Uh, right, but they were at a point of their careers where they were willing to right, stretch their ego to, to prove that they could win a championship. And, and, and it gets to be that point in time where guys say, hey, right, I've got the fame, I've got the glory, I've got the money, now I, now I want to win a title. And so, you know, this happens not only in, in basketball, but it happens across the board where you, when you start looking at your career and, and you want to leave a legacy, you want to say, hey, I want to, I want at least one title, and, and hopefully that you know we're at the stage where guys realize that you know they're not at the end of their career, but they certainly uh, have some knowledge underneath their belt, and now is the time if you want to start leaving a legacy for yourself and, and for people to follow, and that you can talk about after you retire. Now is the time to start playing those seats before it gets too late. And, you know, you talk about, about, yeah, let's, let's find the path. Let's start putting the pieces together. That right. We can, we can seriously challenge to win a title. Mm -hmm. I think that's where our locker room is. And I, and I hope that as, as the days and the, the months, you know, wind down this year, that we're in a position that we can seriously talk about, right, we can do this. Mm -hmm. And they understand, quote, unquote, what the sacrifices mean that, that, that you – Learn to play with the guy next to you. You learn to enjoy the other things that the, that the stat sheet brings, other than how many points you average, and, and then talk about what's really important, truly important, and, and winning and uh, accomplishing the goal. These, these are the things that are, that are important. And well, these are the things that right, we're trying to, to mentor, if you will, through not only our, our actions, but more importantly, our words, and, you know, on the, on the coat, on the, coaching staff that we've assembled that is important if we're going to talk about seriously winning. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking seriously about not only winning, but ultimately winning a title, then, the, then we understand personal agenda. Everybody has. It. You know, and, and like winning a championship should be a team. That's a team goal. But how do you get to the team goal and, and satisfy the personal agenda at the same time? That's, that's what you got to balance out if you're going to change for it. And I don't care if it's Michael Jordan. I don't care if it's Kobe Bryant. I don't care if it's Derek Fisher in regards to Derek Fisher also being a guy that understands that role. It's all about roles. Jimmy, let's do this again very soon, okay? Hey, you, you know the number. You know, I love to talk basketball. <laughs> yes, so you I'm, do. I'll let your beck and call. All righty. Thank you so much, Jimmy Clemens. God bless you, and you're good welcome. luck this year. Thank you very much.
All right, that was a great interview with uh, Jim Cl Jimmy Clemens. I want to thank our sponsors here at the Knobscot Cafe and our friends at Scrub It Up Car Wash because 